Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title for today is Move It or Lose It. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Uh, Joshua 18, 1 to 11. And it's really about getting unstuck. Have you ever really been stuck before? Get the car stuck or the lawnmower or yourself stuck? You ever really been stuck before? Well, on the farm, I've seen some doozies. I've seen some doozies. And often I was on the receiving end of getting stuck, unfortunately. Probably the biggest thing, that the main way I got stuck was with spreading manure. Uh, now, for those who aren't from farms, which is about 99% of you, uh, we, to, we would have to remove the manure every day out of the barn and we had the cows would be chained head back end uh i have to use non-farm words here but uh head to back end and then they would be there and we would feed them and we'd milk them and the whole time they're going to the bathroom right and that was there's a gutter behind them and after we let all the cows out of the barn we chase them all out the dogs would bark bark chase them out uh then we would turn on the gutter cleaner and that was like a big chain thing with paddles that was like in this gutter you know this is a gutter that was about this deep and it would be full of manure we would scrape everything in it would all be there and and then it would just go we'd turn it on and it would go in a big loop through the barn and it would go up up this elevator a little elevator about 10 feet high and it would drop into a manure spreader all right the tractor would be hauling a manure spreader and it would all pile in there and then after that we'd pull the manure spreader up a little bit and go out with a tractor and I had a bucket and a scraper on it we'd scrape the barnyard we'd scrape it all up it was cement you know we'd scrape it scrape it scrape it get into a big pile then I'd use the bucket to get all the manure into the bucket go and pour it into the manure spreader where it was ready to drive the tractor out and be spread out in the field you didn't know I had all these hidden skills did you (laughs) Pretty, you guys, you, better, you know, you better be nice to me. If you're not nice to me, I have other places I could go work, you know. <laughs> it's a lot of farms looking for someone who can handle manure the way I can. <laughs> Sometimes my dad will say, you know, uh, he'll be like, well, aren't you glad you're not farming anymore? We'll be talking about cows and manure or something. Aren't you glad you're not in the farm anymore? I go, well, dad, I kind of feel like I am. I'm still dealing with a lot of crap, you know. <laughs> now, that's not swearing. Don't get upset. That's not cursing. That, that word was, is a polite word of referring to manure. Even my mom, we could say, that was the one word we could say in front of my mom referring to it while she was around. But anyway, we won't go there. Uh, but I'm, I'm really joking. I couldn't go back to the farm. My dad couldn't wait to get rid of me. I was always making a mess of something, uh, which brings us back to spreading manure. Uh, when I would go out to spread manure, sometimes he'd say, go out to you, this field and spread manure. And, you, and I, I would look for, you're supposed to look for the area that needs the manure, you know, where there's less. And I would always really feel bad that well, this one area didn't have manure on it. And I know it was a little damp, damp there, but I would just wanted to spread it there too. And, and I looked okay and I'd go out there and inevitably I'd drive in and I'd get stuck. And not just stuck, but you know what you do then. You really rev it up and the wheel's spinning. You get more stuck, more stuck. And finally, I'm not getting out of here. So I go up, walk up to the barn and get my dad. And, oh, Chucky, you know. And I go walk back out. And he says, why did you go there? You know, I go, because it didn't have any manure. And he goes, it's because it's a bog, you know. We don't put manure there, you know. I, I just thought it should have some, you know. So anyway, I'm OCD, you know. And you know that already. And uh, so... So then I'd have to get out. He goes, all right. He'd go start hooking up his tractor to my tractor. And he goes, and I'd get the manure out. So I'd have to push the lever to open up the back. And then he'd push another lever to the PTO. And it would start, the chains would start moving the manure to the back. And then there was like a beater, metal beater that would throw it out, you know. And, and I'd, I'd empty that manure spreader all out. But when it was finally emptied, then my dad could pull me out and get me unstuck, right? Well, a lot of us need to get unstuck. A lot of us, I'm saying probably all of us, need to get rid of some spiritual baggage uh, and move forward spiritually because we're spiritually stuck just like we're going to see the Israelites were stuck. Okay, just what we're going to see today. Now, we've been looking at the tribes are getting their inheritance, right? The 12 tribes getting their inheritance, and that's a picture of 
us. Remember, we've been talking about that. They're getting a physical inheritance, but it's a picture of our spiritual inheritance. That's what it's a picture of. But not everyone claimed their inheritance, as we're going to see here. Just like many of us don't claim our spiritual inheritance. Like we don't reach our spiritual potential the same way some of these tribes weren't doing that. We get stuck spiritually. Even worse, we start going in reverse. Right? We used to call that backslidden. Remember some of you a little older remember backslidden? We, we get backslidden. Let's, uh, let's pray and then I'll read the passage. Father, we thank you for the worship today. We just, are th we just thank you for that worship and able to connect with you and to refocus on you. And Lord, now we just pray that we would focus on your word and your Holy Spirit would speak to us through your word. That we'd, each of us would take a step forward spiritually today. And if someone here doesn't know you, they've never put their faith in your son Jesus, I pray that today would be that day, a day of salvation. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read the first couple verses first. Joshua 18, starting with verse 1. The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of the meeting there. The country was brought under their control, but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So Joshua said to the Israelites, How long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? It's given to them, but how long before you go take possession of it? Joshua, what is he saying? Get going. He's saying, get moving. Get moving. And Jesus tells us the same thing. It's, remember, Joshua is a picture of Jesus. Hebrew, Greek, same exact word. Uh, it, and, and it's a picture. And Jesus, just as Joshua is telling them to get moving, Jesus is telling us through this and all through the New Testament the same thing. And so many Christians today, nobody here, but you might know somebody like this. <laughs> so many Christians say cross the Jordan River. They're saved, they have their salvation, they put their faith in Jesus Christ, they ask God for forgiveness, put their faith in Christ, they give their life to him, they, they're saved, they cross that Jordan River, like we saw the, all the symbolism, but they never realize their spiritual inheritance or their potential in Christ. Their names are, well, we'll say we, our names are written in the book of life, but then we take a spiritual vacation. Like I said, nobody here. In fact, the, the statistics show that the majority of those people who accept Jesus, who accept Jesus, are no longer in church eight weeks long later. You know, you see all these big crusades and things and all that, and, and the majority of those people don't keep going to church. They don't, they're no longer there. And, and I heard a warning a long time ago, and I can't remember the guy's name, but I remember him saying, is talking about no fruit. There's got to be fruit. If you accept Jesus, there's got to be fruit, right? Uh, or it's not real. And, and the saying was, no change, no Jesus. No Jesus, no change. I've told the story many times, and I'll just mention it. You remember when I was younger and I stuck the scissors in the electrical socket. I was like five or something, and I stuck them in. Remember, and, I, and when I came to, my mom was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, and, but, but she didn't have to ask me what I did, right? She knew what I did. She knew I connected with a powerful electric source, and, and there was now, you know, I had something affected me. And if we connect with Jesus Christ, there will be a change. There will be a change. So, we're saved. We start with the salvation. We're saved, but there's no sanctification. We're saved. And you, many, I hope most, most of you, but I, I hope everybody, before you leave today, knows what it means to be saved. Salvation. The Bible calls it Salvation. God saves us from something, from our sin. It's when we say, God, I believe Jesus died for my sin on that cross. He paid for everything I've ever done wrong. I believe he died on that cross for me. He came back alive from the dead for me to show he was the son of God. And I put my faith in him. I ask you to forgive me of all that sin. I put my faith in Jesus. I'm going to follow him. The moment we do that, we have salvation. But so many don't then pursue sanctification. We never kill the lusts. We never battle for holiness. We never find our spiritual gifts and use our spiritual gifts. We never begin to witness and, and share our faith and help other people find salvation. The Bible calls it in uh, 1 Corinthians carnal, carnal Christians. Some of your versions say worldly. It's a carnal Christian. It's a worldly Christian. It's, it's someone who stays a spiritual baby. 
spiritual baby. Now, babies are cute, right? Don't we all love babies? Well, some more than others. But anyway, we, we, love, we love babies, right? They're so cute, so cute. But what happens if they don't grow up? That's tragic, isn't it? When a baby doesn't grow up, if, if they're hindered in some way, they they're, you know, you know, have that some kind of problem, it's, it's tragic. And that's the picture with Christianity. It's great when someone becomes a Christian. We love it. But it's very important to grow up. In fact, in Hebrews 5, it says, listen to what he says here in Hebrews 5, verse 11. He says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It's tragic if we just live on milk, spiritual milk, if we don't learn to eat solid food, if we don't learn to become a teacher and help other people grow, if we don't know the difference between good and evil. So many times I, I talk to people who claim they're Christians, but they approve of something that's not, that the Bible says is wrong, or they're living in a certain way that the Bible says is wrong. And I'll say, what are you doing? Oh, you know, they make some excuse, sir, you know, God doesn't care, God loves everybody and all that stuff, all that, that, those lies. And I'm like, it's because they never grew up. They never grew up. They've never learned to distinguish good from evil. The Bible tells us very clearly, and if we know God's word, we know how to live and how to live it. Very, very clear in, in God's word. The, the, these the carnal Christians, I'll give you an example. Half of the country claims to be born again. Did you know that 50% of all Americans claim to be born again? All right. Now, being born again is a very biblical word. Jesus said, you must be born again. So when someone says to me, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a born again Christian, well... Uh-oh, you know, because Jesus said you must be born again. But there's a lot of flavors in born again, aren't there? That guy in the purple hair behind the goalpost, you remember that guy, you know, John 3, 60, you know, he ended up in jail, I think. But anyway, the, uh, he did, he really did. But anyway, the, there's a lot of flavors in born again, but there's a biblical born again. But half of, that means you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, given your life to Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is talking about, being born again. Half of all Americans claim to be born again, but only one in ten Americans, I'm, no, I'm going to say born again, only one in ten born again Christians, one in ten, that's 5% of the population, one in ten born again Christians allow their faith to impact their decisions. Think about that. All these born again Christians, and only, only one in ten allows their faith to impact the way that they live, or the, their biblical, or their worldview is affected by the Bible. Think about that. How can there be so many Christians in this country and the mess we're in? That's why. And not only that, only, now here's another stat, only, out of all the born-again Christians, 50%, only 7% of all Americans believe that, that, that they've accepted Jesus as their Savior and, not just accept, but and believe he's the one way to God, that the Bible is infallible, and that Satan is real. That's it, 7%. It tells you a lot. And it goes for churches, too. Churches get comfortable. Churches get inward focused. Churches lose their, 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 their vision. They, they get away from the Word of God. And then when they do that, it gets negative. And churches then begin to focus on other people's faults. <laughs> Nobody here. But start to focus on other people's faults instead of reaching the unsaved. You ever been a part of a church like that? Every church has got the DNA for it. We got to be careful, don't we? We start to focus on other people's faults instead of reaching the lost. And that makes the jo devil's job very easy. A lot of people say, oh, the devil got to this church. The devil had nothing to do with it. Those people are stupid, you know? It's stupidity. We are stupid. The devil half the time doesn't have to make us do it or tempt us to do it. It's just our sinful stupidity, really. That's what does it. We're just being, we're not following God's word. And that's why I say stupid. It's unwise. unwise. I got to say the right kind of word. Okay, but anyway. So, over 5,000 churches in America close every year. Not that many are being planted, I promise you that. We're losing ground. 80% of all churches are either plateaued or in decline. 80%. Only, even out of those who are growing, the other 20%, 
only 1% of all church growth is because of evangelism. Did you know that? 1%. So, you know, of a hot church somewhere, and, and they're like, growing, how are they growing, how are they growing? I'm going to tell you how they're growing. They're borrowing Christians. They're about, and some churches go very quickly. Everybody gets on the merry-go-round. They all go to that church. Everybody, then they get tired of that. They're in a fight. Something happens. They all get on the merry-go-round and go to another church. And, and I'm not saying God does move people and you know, we prayerfully move. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the merry-go-rounders, right? And, and most, the, the 1% is the church growth through evangelism. I remember when I heard this statistic, I was at part of a church that was really growing fast, a lot of evangelism. And I was the pastor of youth and evangelism at this time. It was a while back. I was pastor of youth and evangelism, and we were seeing people saved every week. We were all excited. People were coming in. We gained like 100 people in one year. It was really growing. And, and I remember reading that saying, well, not our church. Nuh-uh. We're growing the right way. And, and, and I was saying, I'm going to add it up. So I did the math. I got out the church directory, and the people were visiting and coming, and blah, blah, blah. And I started doing the math, and I came up with the number of people that were s- new Christians, and the people that had just come into the church, the 100 people. And, and I went and did all the math, and, and I came up with 2%. Two per- and, but we doubled the average, but it was still terrible. Most church growth, I'm like, even my church, yeah, most church growth is People hopping. Rabbit Christians, right? <laughs> so, but I'm not saying, I know God leads, and I'm not criticizing that. I know God leads us to different places at different times. But I'm talking about the real growth should be happening because we're reaching people for Jesus Christ. That should be the real growth, right? We Christians, we're just like the Israelites. We have a motivation problem. And God gives them the answer to that motivation problem in Joshua 18, starting with verse 4. The next couple of verses. God tells them a point... Through Joshua, appoint three men from each tribe. I will send them out to make a survey of the land and to write a description of it according to the inheritance of each. Then they will return to me. You are to divide, divide the land into seven parts. Judah is to remain in its territory in the south side and the house of Joseph in its territory in the north. After you have written descriptions of the seven parts of the land, bring them here to me and I will cast lots for you in the presence of the Lord our God. The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you because the priests service of the Lord is their inheritance and Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have already received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it to them. As the men started on their way to map out the land, Joshua instructed them, go and make a survey of the land and write a description of it. Then return to me and I will cast lots for you here at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. So the men left and went throughout the land, through the land. The They wrote its description on a scroll, town by town, in seven parts, and returned to Joshua in the camp of Shiloh. Shiloh. Then Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord, and there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. God sent them out with a promise and a plan. He sent them out with a plan and a promise. And the the promise was a guarantee. They had already guaranteed, I've given it to you. We've already saw that many, many times. A guaranteed reward. And this was meant to motivate them, to show them what they could have. Just like when we study the Bible, right? Show them what they can have. Motivate them to get moving, to get unstuck. What if I I told you, it's like this. What if I told you uh, there's gold in your backyard? I know now that I just was studying one of my old history books and Pirates Buried Treasure gold in your backyard. You just got to go dig for it. How deep would you dig? As deep as it took, right? You would keep digging, digging, digging as deep as it took to get to that gold. It's like cereal box. Kids, you remember when you were a kid and there was a, the, the prize in the box? I know, a lot of you. Prize in the box, right? And you had the prize. It'd be the, the, that decoder ring or this something stupid, worthless. I, not, I mean, unwise and worthless. But I, I, I got to remember this. Okay, but anyway, the it was something silly, right? But we thought it was great, or you had to get so many things, and you could send it in and get something really worthless, you know? You know, talking about those telescopes we used to get, you know? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, they fell apart the day you got them. Uh, so, so, but what would happen, as soon as you, if you got to be the first one to open that cereal box, what did you do? Oh, it's not there. You just pour out a little bit. No, not there. Okay, I'll wait for the next person to get it. Oh, yeah, ripping and reaching and crunching and smashing, and that box looked like it had been through a tornado, right? And the next person would come, who got it first? And my mom would, who wrecked the cereal box? We got, you know, got that ring, right? You know, so, uh, 
But that we were motivated, and that's the whole point of God giving them this promise and, and, and the details, and the same reason he gives us our spiritual promises and what we should have. It's meant, for, it's, it's, it's meant to motivate us. God has a plan. Just as he had a plan for Israel, he has a plan for his church today. He has a plan for we, us as Christians today. God has a plan for every person here. He has a plan. He has a plan for each of us. Second Peter 1.3 is one of the one of the great pictures of his plan. Second Peter one three it says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God has given us power to live a godly life. And how do we get it? Through our knowledge of him. And where do we find that? It's in God's word. It's not on TV. It's not, it's not on, you know, the, you know, our iPod. Well, it could be if you download the right stuff. But, but my point is, it, it's God's word. And it's vital for every one of us to be in his word. To, to be in the word where we will find the power for sanctification. Whatever you are struggling with, you can beat it. Whatever your battle is, you can win it. Whatever you're going through, you can persevere and endure it. You can. How do I know? Because God's word says it. And he says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. No matter what you're facing in your life, God's power is there. He's given it to us. It's a promise, and, it, and, it, and it's true. Through our knowledge of him, it's vital, but it's vital for us to be in the word where we'll find the power for sanctification. And it takes time with God. It takes time. I don't know when you get it. Uh, I know I've got to get it early in the morning, or else I don't get it. You know, at my house, you can imagine the, you know, the, the, the tsunami that hits around 7.30 o'clock, or 8 o'clock, right? But, but it's got to be early. But, but it has to be that time. It could be any time for you, that time to, the, the, where we study our Bible, where we memorize, we, verse really hits us, we memorize it, we meditate. It's got to have time for meditation. Got to, got to have it. I go for long walks. That's my time to meditate, time to pray. It takes that prayer time. And it can be, but, but it could be anything for you. You might have a long commute. commute. You might be in the car and you put in the, the, your your. your podcast, you can play something, the God's Word, or, or a good Bible teaching. Uh, you could be in the train, you take commuting, you're on the train. could be anywhere that you are. That, that does, there's no right or wrong way, but the point is we have to connect with God, and, and maybe it's a podcast. A lot of younger people like the online stuff. You can do online through Karen. You know, we have a Bible school right down the road. You can do all kinds of online stuff and grow. You could, our if you miss our, the NHCC podcast, you go on there. But there's so many good ones. I know a lot of you listen to Ravi and, diff, and different people. And uh, there's so many, many good ones. The, the point is to connect. But we also need Bible-centered fellowship. We need that time alone with God, but we need that Bible-centered fellowship. Church, key time. Key time. There's something about our culture. I've been to church this week. I can take next week off. You know, or I've been there once, that, that's my time for the month. You know, it's kind of a culture, right? But listen, we, what if I said, well, I ate this week, I'm not going to eat next week. But that's what we do. We, we need that Bible fellowship. We need that time. And I know we go away, and I'm not talking about vacations. All that. I'm talking about when we could be there and we should be there. It, we need that connection time. And not only that, we have Bible studies, men Bible studies, women's Bible studies. We have home fellowships all different days, nights of the week. And, and we're going to start some of the days. We have these home fellowships, prayer groups, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, prayer groups. Friday, Friday is another prayer group that's going. We have youth group for the teenagers. We have discipleship, one-on-one -on -one discipleship. We got all these things, and, and it's so important that you get connected and stay connected to move forward spiritually. It, it's being part of a team. What if you want to be a pro basketball player? What's the best way to become a pro basketball player? Practice, right. And, and practice is very, very important. Uh, and grow, grow tall. But uh, that's another important thing. Uh, doesn't matter. You know, well, anyway, I'm not going to go there. But I, I, I couldn't play in the NBA. But anyway, the, uh, but also, if you want to really go far, is it better to practice alone or with a team? Team. You, imp alone's important, but you'll never reach your potential unless you become part of a team. A team. And not just a team. There needs to be a coach. Coaches 
are the ones who really help us move forward. And that's why it's so important. Are you, do you, are you part of a team? Are you, do you have a coach? Are you reaching your potential? Are you moving forward? Talk to me. Talk to Kim. We will connect you with a group. We'll connect you with a coach. We'll, we'll, we'll coach you. We'll, we'll get you connected to, to reach your full potential. We'll help, you, we'll help you learn to study your Bible on your own and do the individual practice. We'll help you all that. Talk to me. We'll get you connected with the right people and the right ministries and the right resources because it's vital to move forward. If you're not moving forward, guess where, you're, where you are? There's no neutral in the spiritual life. There is no neutral. We are either moving forward, Bible teaches it very clearly, or we're going woo, backward, all right? We're going backward. We'll suffer spiritual reverses. In fact, look at Second Peter again, right after verse 3, talking about spiritual reverses. He says here in verse 4, uh, I'm going to go to verse 5. We'll start with verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly love, and to brotherly love, godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind. And has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. In, make every effort, increasing measure. Now, we know it's all by God's mercy and grace, but we're back to the, God's word, right? But, but in, increasing measure, moving forward. Uh, we, it, it, it's vital, it's vital that, that, we, that we move forward. If we are not moving forward, we're becoming blind. We're moving backward. What step are you on? Looking at this step. Which step are you on? Are, do you see increasing measure? Are you hitting each of these steps? Are you moving forward? Do we see an increasing measure? Because if we're not, we are going spiritually blind. Blind. And if we're going blind, it takes something drastic, doesn't it? I know a number of you have told me about what you're going through because you're facing some eye problems and you're getting the shots in the eyes. We're not going to have you raise hands. But a lot of people are getting shots in the eyes, right? And it's not fun, but it's better than going blind, right? And, 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 and that's what this God's telling us here in Second Peter. You, you're going to go blind if you don't keep... And here he gives us a shot. You want a shot? Here's a shot. The very next verse, verse 10. Here's our spiritual shot for this morning. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. Make your calling and election sure. Do these things save us? No. What saves us? Faith. But how do we know that faith is real? How do we make our calling and election sure? How do we do that? If we don't have these fruit, just heard it, the increasing fruit. If we're not seeing fruit in our life, that increasing fruit, we have no assurance. We still could be saved. We could just be backslidden. But there's no assurance. There's got to be that increasing fruit. That's your shot in the eye for this morning, okay? Uh, that, that needle in the eye, right from 2 Peter 1.10. So we have God's plan for each of us, but he also gives us, Jesus gives us a plan for his church too, moving the church forward too. Uh, Matthew 28.18-20. Who knows what it's called? Great Commission. Thank you. I got one. Yeah. The Great Commission. Listen, if you don't remember anything else I say today, Remember the Great Commission. This is, this is it. This is, this is big. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus gives the Great Commission. Very, very important. This is God's plan for his church. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Did I miss anything? All right, so anyway, uh, the Great Commission. This is his plan for the church, to go. All right, there's no such thing as sitting. It's going. Make disciples. Notice he didn't say make believers. In America, we make believers, right? No, no. Disciple is a radical is a radical follower of Jesus Christ. He, we are called to make 
disciples that know and live the Word of God. And that means we must know and live the Word of God. We have, you can't make something you aren't. If we are a disciple, a radical follower, we're called to make them of other people. Very, very important. Uh, then, then he says, make disciples what? Of all nations. That's our call. Of all nations. We either have to go or we have to help someone else go. We have to somehow help someone reach all, all the others. But even if we don't go to all nations, we are all called to make disciples of all nations. We are all called. You may be called across the world or, or around, I mean, around the world or across the street. Across the street or around the world. But we are all called to reach someone and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And not only that, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism. Show someone's faith. Once you put your faith in Christ, you know, the Bible teaches to be baptized, to show your faith in Christ. We're going to have one August 12th. August 12th down there on Lewis Island. It's always the most moving, touching service of the year, right? Awesome. If you, I want to encourage you, if you've never been baptized, you've, if you put your faith in Christ and never taken that step of, of going under that water, I encourage you to, to talk to me. And also uh, bring someone. Maybe there's someone that God's calling you to get ready for baptism, to get, bring them to that place they're ready to be baptized. August 12th, save that date. It's an awesome, awesome time. But it's vital to know the Great Commission, to live it, to focus on it. The Great Commission, what is it called? The, the Great Commission. Thing. The Great Commission. And the reason I'm doing it is most Christians don't even know what that is. Did you know that? Most Christians don't know what the Great Commission is. They've done studies. Very, very few. I want to make sure you guys... Here, I'm not going to stand before God and say, you didn't even explain the Great Commission? Yeah. So I want to make sure we got that, right? But Jesus lays it out in even more detail, what he's talking about in Acts chapter 1. Just before his ascension, he gives a little bit more uh, detail on the Great Commission. The disciples are like, when, when are you going to come again? What's going on? What, when is all this going to happen? They're saying, when are you coming back, Jesus? And listen to what he says to them. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Acts chapter 2, right? Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, why did he, why did he start with Jerusalem? Where were they? Jerusalem, that was where they lived right then. That's where they were staying, in Jerusalem. It's where we live. It's where we live. That's where we have to start with the gospel, where we live. And, he, and Jesus is start with Jerusalem. Speaking of Jerusalem, what a week, huh? What a prophetic week. That Jerusalem was recognized as the capital of Israel, finally, and other countries are jumping in on it. That was prophecy being fulfilled. Jesus said it was going to happen someday again, and it did happen. But Jesus already beat, beat us to the punch. Uh, he recognized that 2,000 years ago, right? But what a prophetic week we've seen. Uh, then he says, Judea. What's Judea? The region. We live here in Bucks County. If you're from New Jersey, it's Hunterdon County, right? That, that, that's the region that we're from. He said, you've got to reach the region, too. Very important. Then he says, Samaria. <laughs> the brakes, step on the brakes. Wait a minute. That's like a place they didn't want to go. That's like, and Philadelphia, inner city. Or the inner city. Or Trenton, down in the inner city of Trenton. That's where you got to go next. <laughs> Wait a minute. We're not so comfortable. We can all kind of laugh about that because that's far off. But Samaria also is closer sometimes. This week we had the, the Celebrates Week, right? The Pride Week here. And there's about 10,000 people living in our New Hope Solbury community. And they projected, I think the rain cut it down dramatically, but, but the rain, they projected another 10,000 coming to the town that we were going to double in size for the week. For the weekend, at least. And, and the reason I say it is because the Samaritans were, and the Jews, they didn't trust each other. They didn't like each other. They didn't understand each other. The Samaritans were off base. They, they had twisted the scripture so much that they were worshiping a false, they weren't even worshiping the one true God anymore. They had twisted it. Jesus said, you must come through the Jews. He told the Samaritans, you must go through God's word. You're wrong. Mary told the woman at the well, you're wrong. Jesus can say that. But there was not a trust there. And, they, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. There wasn't a trust. But you know what? 
All kinds of awesome things. And they got the apostles are teaching with power. You know, that Peter is preaching with power. Thousands are getting saved. It's awesome, awesome. You read the book of Acts, awesome, awesome time. I know one of the home fellowships is doing that. It was awesome. And they got so they, got so they were enjoying the koinonia fellowship, Greek uh, koinonia. But as a result, they ended up getting koinonitis. It, they got quinonitis. They got, you know, they got rigid and stuck there. And, and they, didn't, they didn't leave. They all stayed in Jerusalem. And so God got them unstuck. Guess how? You're not going to like it. Acts 8.1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. They finally got unstuck. And look what it took. They finally began to fulfill the Great Commission. <laughs> Seven chapters later, eight chapters later. But look what it took. It took persecution. It works for purity too. You read the Bible. It works for purity too. It purifies the church too. It's probably why we're seeing so much persecution today. God is getting ready to move. He's getting ready to move. Jesus, I believe, is getting ready to come back again. But he's got to prepare the church purity, and he's got to fulfill the Great Commission. It's got to be fulfilled. He, we've got to fulfill his Great Commission, and we haven't finished it yet. We're getting closer and closer, but we're not finished yet. In fact, in Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end times and just before he comes back again. And listen to what he says, the signs of the ends of the age. Verse 9 in, in uh, Matthew 24, he says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Worldwide persecution. When I was a kid, that was hard to imagine. Is it hard to imagine today? No, it's not, is it? But there's a purpose to it. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all men, all nations, and then the end will come. Both have to happen. Worldwide persecution and worldwide evangelism to all nations in all nations and to all nations. Jesus isn't coming back again until that's fulfilled. That's fulfilled. What is God's plan for us at New Hope Community Church? What is God's plan? Are we fulfilling it? Are we impacting New Hope Solbury? Are we impacting Lambertville? Are we impacting Bucks County and Hunterton County? Are we impacting Philly and Trenton? Are we impacting the world? Are we fulfilling it? What ministries are we called to start to do this? What ministry has God laid on your heart? I think of the employment support group. You know, that's just started to try to reach out to the, to the, to the, 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 the area that we live in. And boy, has Len done a great job. You talk about a plan and a purpose. It's been awesome to see God working. Next meeting is tomorrow. But there's so many different ministries that we could start like that. So many different ways to reach people. And not only that, just serving in the body of Christ. There's so many ways that we could use our gifts and, and just serve. Uh, Zach just told me today, you know, yesterday, two days ago, sorry, Zach, a couple days ago, he just said, I really need more youth leaders. He needs people to come in alongside of him and help him reach the, the kids of New Hope in, in Lambertville for Jesus Christ. He needs uh, youth leaders. Um, the, the, the setup team, Brian just told me, and I need help setting up. You know, we, this service is important. Worship and, and the word is important, but they need, they, people get tired. We need help setting up. You could just help See Brian. We uh, we need help with the sound team. More people to help Matt out on the, the back team and his team back there. Uh, and the tech team, Rebecca's on her own. We need more people on the tech team. We, we need people to serve here in the body of Christ here too. Uh, back to the, the Great Commission. Mission trips. We already are ministering in, in the Philippines. It's awesome. But there's many other ways that we can minister. And, and how is God calling us to, to reach out? On, on, maybe it's a, a mission trip. You go on a mission trip. Start small. You never know where God is going to lead. I remember when Scott Harrison was here. Remember? And we prayed for him and sent him to the mercy ships. And then, you know, you know what I'm talking about? And, you know, we prayed for him. It's, he goes off to the mercy ships. And then he's on the mercy ships and he sees all this tremendous need. And people would dirty water and killing on them, diseases. And, and then he felt led by God on that mercy ship to start charity water. And now look how many, how many million people have they given water to that God started with that little mission trip to mercy ship and he ends up 
starting Charity Water. God may lead you guys to do some amazing things. There are tremendous spiritual needs out there. That, just like we sang the song, I Will Go, that was a perfect song. That was perfect. Uh, you know, that, you know that's, that's what God is calling us to do. How is he calling us to do? Maybe it's a church plant. Maybe God is calling us to plant another church. You know, as, you know there's another area in our region that, that needs a church, a gospel-preaching church. And, and that's God's leading us to do that. What is God's plan for you? What is God's plan for me, for us? Am I moving forward? Maybe I'm saved, but am I moving forward in sanctification and radical discipleship? What do I need to do? What's my plan? What do, who do I need to connect with? Who can coach me? Who do I need to connect with? Am I making disciples? Am I sharing my faith? Is, am I, is the Great Commission, the last thing Jesus said, is that my focus of my life, of my every day? Is that my focus? Who is God calling me to reach? Who is God, what life is God calling me to touch? We change the world. It looks impossible, but it takes one life at a time. The, you change the world one life at a time, starting with ours and then someone else, helping someone else. And you just share your story. I say this all the time. Just share your story. You don't have to argue with people or you know, be a great apologist. All the apologetics is great, don't get me wrong. But we don't have to be able to argue with people. You know, tell your story. You don't have to convert people with their outcome crazy views or something. You know, it, it, it's tell your story. That's what really touches people. It's your story. Look at the stories. Look at the testimony times we've had here. The stories we can tell of God's power in our life, of God's mercy and grace in our life. Just tell your story. Let, see, let people see your faith wherever you are, whatever you're going through. Let them see it. I can't tell you how many people since A year ago, this week, you know, Ryan died. It's always sad. You know, people say, are you going to be sad one year? I'm like, it's always sad. But I can't tell you how many people, as hard as it was and as tough as it was, how many people still, every week, daily sometimes, come up and say, oh, I, I've been listening to your podcast. I started with Ryan's funeral. I came to the funeral, and I listened to it, and I've been listening to the podcast. And, and, and I just got to say that your faith has really touched me. And, and you know, your family has handled this. It's really touched me. And it's really helped me spiritually. And, and I'm really trying to seek God in this. And, and for my life, for my because everybody has trials. Everybody has struggles. Whether you can see them or not, we all have struggles. And, it, it, and, it's, and it's, it's just letting people see God's power in your life. Not your perfect life. The mess, right? God's a junk artist, the ultimate junk artist. He sees how he, God can take the mess and bring something beautiful out of it. And that's just letting him see our story and share our story. Have you been saved? Do you have a story? Have you experienced God's salvation? John 3, 16 says, For God... So love the world. That's you. That's every one of us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever put your faith. Believe means to put your faith in. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ. Who came and died on a cross in our place. For our sin. For everything we've ever done. Wrong. He paid that price. His blood paid that price. He died in our place as a substitute. And we, all we need to do is receive that gift. All we need to do is put our faith in him. Turn away from that sin. Put our faith in him and give our life to him. Have you ever taken that step of faith? Let's pray. Oh, 
How is God speaking to us this morning? Maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. You've never experienced God's salvation. You've never put your faith in his son Jesus. Today can be that day. Right where you're sitting, right where you are at this very moment, you can reach out to God through prayer and experience salvation. To have life now and forever with God someday. It's a simple prayer of faith. God, please forgive my sin. I repent of everything wrong I've ever done. Please forgive me. I'm putting my faith in Jesus. My complete trust in Jesus. I give you my life, God. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, something radical, amazing, powerful has happened. You now have God's power in you through his Holy Spirit living in you. And he's going to begin to change you in ways you never dreamed possible. And the best part is you now can talk to God and depend on him anytime, anywhere, for anything. If you've taken that step of faith, let somebody know. Maybe you have a friend or family member here. Tell me on the way out. Fill out the card. Put it in the box. Email, text. Let somebody know so that we can encourage you and coach you in your new life in Christ. For those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe we're stuck. And today's the day we get unstuck. We begin to move forward spiritually again. How is God calling us to do that? How is he calling us to do something to fulfill the Great Commission? Maybe someone he's put on our heart right now to share our story. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would complete what you're starting today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.